Hey there, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis here, along with Rolf Jacobson. And we want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to our fall campaign. We are happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we met our ambitious $50,000 goal and secured $10,000 in matching funds. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are so grateful for all of you who choose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as Working Preacher Sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for helping to keep Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for December 20th, 2020, the fourth Sunday of Advent. The first reading is 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 11 and 16. The psalm is Psalm 89, 1 through 4 and 19 through 26. The epistle is Romans 16, 25 through 27, and the gospel is Luke 1, 26 through 38. Well, I, I love the Annunciation. It's one of my absolute favorite passages uh, in all of um, scripture. Uh, and But the first thing I would like to invite preachers to do uh, this particular year is to ask themselves what reminds you or what uh, passage helps you remember that God regards you, that God sees you, that God favors you. Uh, in a time when uh, we all know the stresses of, of doing ministry for many, many reasons. Uh, and, and here we are coming up to Christmas and all of that uh, added, <laughs> that added intensity and added stress. I, I want the preacher just to stop and say, God regards you as well. And so what, what helps you remember that? What helps you keep that in mind? Uh, just as God regarded Mary, God regards you. No, that's just for the preacher. I'll get to other things to preach on later, but that's where I want to start. <laughs> How come it's just for the preacher, not for other people? That's the preaching part. <laughs> okay. That's no, that's what I mean. That's a preaching part. But we go. We, the, the preacher goes uh, quickly to okay. What do I need to? What, what will I say for my people? And I want them to hear the, this text for them first. That's what I mean. And it and again. But then that the homiletical move can be uh, uh, that God regards you, uh, God favors you. What is it? What and what does it feel like to be seen? What does it feel like to be regarded when, uh, for all intents and purposes, you think you shouldn't be, or why? Sh why would you be? Or uh, what? What is what is noticeable about you, or what's worthy about you? Uh, and so I think that's that's a homiletical direction you could certainly take in the passage. Uh, but I wanted the preacher just to stop and say, don't forget that God regards you too. And I appreciated that move of your question, Caroline, because of the preparation um, of, of just the heart and mind of the, uh, of the preacher. Um, the homiletical move that I would make on this one, and I love uh, the commentary. I, I, I too, um, have been moved by uh, Renita Weems' lifting up of Mary. But in light of this year, um, I really um, was drawn to this sense of who is the God that is calling us. Uh, this, you know, what it, how can this be favored? Uh, I love the way that uh, Courtney captures this sense of in this moment, in this, in, in, in her time, what was happening to Mary didn't have to be received as good news. And so I left uh, reading this passage this year really wanting to focus on who is this God? Um, what did Mary already know about this God that when she receives this news, she can say, here am I, um, let it be done 
to me according to your word. Well, I've got to trust something about this God. If my life is about to be turned upside down the way that her life, as described so well in the commentary, actually was turned upside down. And that's how I feel that in this world right now. Well, another another uh, homiletical uh, move I would make, direction I would go, is I, I talked about this uh, in an article I, I uh, wrote recently, uh, but I was really, I landed too with this passage in the space between how can this be and nothing will be impossible for God. And uh, it's a, it's a pregnant space, um, if you will. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a full space uh, that, that, yeah, that holds something um, that holds something really quite extraordinary of, of questioning um, and how can this be? And I, I, I imagine all kinds of other questions behind that for Mary. I mean, yes, I'm a virgin, but how can this be? And because of who, who I am and how can this be that, that the Lord has seen me and how can this be? I mean, there are so many questions behind that one question. And to ask, and to ask those questions and to sit in that space of asking those questions. Uh, and then, and then uh, what does it... What does it feel like then to get to for nothing will be impossible with God, but maybe to what extent a lot of people can't get there right now um, that that maybe 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 they just let Mary say that for them this year, uh, because they're in they're in that in between space of how can all of this be, how can these things be, and are not quite. Um, not quite to the place of being able to say nothing is impossible with God. And so maybe we let Mary, Mary preach, or maybe, um, maybe we let Mary give witness to the kind of faith that perhaps we can't summon right now, uh, but maybe lies, lies in wait in a, in a promised future. So that's another, that's another, yeah, that's another direction I would take um, with this passage this year. I think I want to be careful with how I phrase this, but it's Mary speaks, but in a way her body also speaks or her body also bears witness to that line of nothing will be impossible with God that, um, and again, having never been pregnant, I really want to be really careful how I state this, but I would imagine that there's, when the words fail or she wakes up a week later one morning, <laughs> <laughs> and all the questions are still there, right? Her body continues to bear witness in ways beyond her ability to control it, right? And so there's, to herself and perhaps to, to others, certainly that will come with Elizabeth in the next scene, but this, this horizon that everything's pointing toward, nothing will be impossible with God. I was going to use a pun like how it gestates, but I don't think I should do that, should I? But you know what I mean? That there's a way in which her, the way she bears witness is more than just her voice or her volition or her faithfulness and certainly more than her understanding. It's something that's become alive now in her and has become alive in the entire world. Um, and this is the horizon for Luke and Acts as well, that this idea of of impossibility, of something growing and persisting, despite anybody's ability really to explain it or to stop it or anything like that. I think the commentary does, uh, there are some of the, what you're saying, Matt, is, uh, is one of the ways in which uh, Courtney plays that out in terms of that a romanticized reading of the Immaculate Conception ignores the embodied complexities of pregnancy in the ancient world. And it's not just not, and as you're talking about, uh, not only in Mary's pregnant body, but the way in which her pregnant body has to move in the world uh, and still live in the world uh, and, and still carry on uh, responsibilities and duties of being in that world. And so, and yet in that state. And so, yeah, there's something, um, there's something deeply poignant in that. And, uh, and particularly theologically appropriate in that it, to preach, to kind of preach that radical embodiedness um, when we're talking about the incarnation. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, she's in a village of maybe 50 to 75 families. Um, 
getting pregnant was the most dangerous thing that could happen to a woman. Still probably has been throughout history in terms of just um, chances of dying. I mean, there's all of these things that, that, that she brings up there. So yeah, I'm not trying to romanticize it, um, but to talk about the risk that you enter into. As soon as you confess, or as soon as you hear somebody say, nothing will be impossible with God, you have stepped into utter risk for, for your life, for your sense of comfort. Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And the, the, that's powerful for me, the testimony of the body. Um, it, it, if I think about the, the, the illnesses of folks this, this year, um, the truth telling that getting sick has meant for people um, for some, it's been, um, you know, very light. Uh, it seems like they have a cold. Uh, for others, it has been weeks. Um, I know some who's been months of saying, you know, something is happening here. Um, and the risk for some, it has meant death. Um, and, and I think I think what you just named, and again, uh, it, it's, it's laid out in the, in the um, commentary, but I think the way you named it, uh, Matt, is really powerful uh, in, a, in a time right now where we, we might need to just move out of what we can assent to in our head and pay attention to what is happening in the bodies of those around us. Um, and I had a, a student once preach this, his wife had um, uh, just, uh, was just a few months into a pregnancy. And so he leaned into it as the one not being pregnant, but what was happening to her um, was also happening to him. Um, I, I, I like that angle. Um, I, I got to wrestle with that one, that, that, that's powerful. All right, shall we move on to Isaiah? No, Samuel, 2 Samuel. We've been in Isaiah, 2 Samuel 7, well, the 1 connection, to 11. Yeah, the, the, the connection is obviously with verse 32. Um, the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. 2 Samuel 7 is the covenant with David, right? You get your four major covenants of the Old Testament. Uh, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, and this is the David covenant, and um, the promise that um, David intends to build God a house, and God says, nope, you're not building me a house, I'm going to build you a house, meaning a dynasty, and uh, one of your descendants will forever be king in Jerusalem. That promise appeared to have been broken uh, with the destruction of the southern kingdom, and the end of the Davidic, not line, but the end of its reign. And uh, Israel, with tenacity, believed the promise, believed God always keeps promises. And so for 500 years, they clung to the hope that God would find a way to keep this promise. And uh, the astonishing news that in a crucified um, Davidic, uh, descendant, the, that promise is kept. That is the scandal of the gospel. I just want to yell, preach, Ralph, preach. Um, in, in the moment of uh, what seems to be a loss of the temples we have built for God, um, not for many congregations, not having gathered together in that space, um, but God is faithful, that God is here, that God is um, meeting us, that God is with us. Uh, I, I think that that um, setting up of God saying, I didn't ask you to do this for me. I'm making a promise of what I'm going to do for you can be heard in this season. Um, so amen to what you just said, Ralph. And I think too, like uh, verse six, just to build off of what uh, both of you have just said, 
I, I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent in their tabernacle. And maybe a preacher could paraphrase that um, in some sort of Eugene Peterson message kind of way uh, for COVID days, but something along the lines of, you know, I have not, I have not been in your church since, since the day you closed down. I've been moving about. Um, moving about wherever you are uh, and being with you uh, regardless of that space in that building. And, uh, and I think that would be, I think that would be really powerful for people. And I, I also wanted to point people to the, the commentary and, and the way in which uh, Casey uh, Sigmund pulls that together at the end See now God incarnate covered in the blood and amniotic fluid. See Jesus with the beast nursing from the milk of an unwed teen in the cover of night. When did I ever demand a temple from you? Uh, I go where you go. I am with you. And so I think using some of those words as well would be uh, uh, really meaningful for people this year. Amen. The soul. Yeah. yeah, God's God says I'm not um, I'm not too proud to sleep in a tent. I'm not too proud to live in your heart. I'm cool with the lockdown. God says because <laughs> I'm leaving the building anyway. I've always been on the move. That's right. God's like I don't wear Facebook Live's fine with me. I don't need anything better than that. <laughs> you can worship me on that. Zoom. Yeah, you, you could you could do a lot with that. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, Psalm 89 is this incredibly long psalm of three parts. It's got this, uh, it's, it's actually a big, it's, a, it, it's first of all a psalm of thanksgiving for the Davidic covenant. You see that, um, I will sing of your steadfast love, right? So you get this, it's a, right, it's a hymn, it's a, a praising God for the, um, for the, um, covenant with David. And that's the only part of the psalm you get here, because and then it skips ahead to um, still in the first third of the psalm uh, up in, in these verses, um, talking about the Davidic covenant. Um, for those interested, then it goes into a, um, then it really goes into uh, a uh, psalm of lament for the destruction and the loss of the Davidic covenant. But that's, uh, it's interesting because it sets up how long, how many, you know, half a millennium they had to wait for the fulfillment of the promise. It's, uh, I think out of context, it'd be a, a really weird thing to preach on, uh, on the fourth Sunday of Advent. So I think here it's mostly uh, liturgical content, uh, context, excuse me. And I have nothing else to say about it today. I, I think you summed it up nicely. Very nicely. I, I agree. agree. If Thank you're you. looking for a good Advent maskill, this is the one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Advent maskill, funny man. Yeah. Yep. Maskill. Ethan the Ezraite, one of his best. Yep. It is one of his best. Uh, anyway, let's let's move on. Uh, All right. The Romans to... doxology. I'm going to say it before Caroline does. <laughs> we can actually get into it but this is the one that i would use liturgically this is the one where i would end the service with this being the blessing as people were leaving but there are other things i'm sure we can talk about but i just what a promise uh in the midst of of you know this awareness of god you know recognizing us um regarding us um being with us to be reminded that now unto uh, this God who is able to strengthen you according to this good news, the proclamation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed. This is a, this is a great way to end a service for me.